Thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with you today. And I'm going to talk about uh, a sort of intellectual journey that I've been on um, over the last few years. I come from a, a family and a, a generation that thinks uh, and learned that um, one of the ways of uh, creating peace and harmony in the world was about binding people together and um, that the more interdependent we become through trade, through travel, through the internet, through the ties that have been built between people and countries over generations, the safer the world is and the more likely we are to, to, um, to get on and to, uh, to avoid uh, conflict with one another. But um, over the last few years, I've, I've come to, to question some of the assumptions that, that I had and to ask some very difficult questions about how uh, globalization and how these ties that, that bind us together could actually be having exactly the opposite consequences from, from what we hoped. And I've come to wonder whether even as we come through the, the hottest phase of COVID, we might be entering a, a new pandemic, which is um, starting to, to rip our world apart in new ways. And like COVID, it's something which uh, is spreading exponentially, which is extract, sorry, exploiting the cracks in our, in our connected system, um, and which is causing uh, a huge amount of, of pain and, and suffering around the world. But unlike COVID, it's not a biological phenomenon which uh, unites all of, of humanity against it. It's something which people and countries are, are doing uh, to each other. And uh, to put it simply, what we're seeing is that the ties that, that, um, that uh, bind people together are, are literally being uh, turned into weapons. And that's um, what I... Uh, would like to talk to you about today. Um, when my book came out uh, in the fall, the big uh, geopolitical event that everyone was talking about was um, was Afghanistan and the um, the withdrawal from Afghanistan of, of the West. And this photo um, came to be seen as a bit of a symbol of of a big turning point in, in geopolitics, the end, uh, people hoped, of the forever wars. It's a shocking photo because um, what you see as that plane takes off is Afghan citizens clambering onto it and trying to, to, to escape from the country. And the fact that they were left behind on the runway, some of them even falling to their death, was seen as a, a symbol of the determination of the Biden administration to escape from uh, from the from the um, forever wars, people were quite shocked. Partly because they feared what would happen to Afghanistan. It was a human tragedy, but also maybe even more fundamentally, there was a sense that we were entering a new geopolitical era because the Afghan mission had been a product of a different way of thinking about the world, a connected world with a liberal international order where democracy could be spread right around the world. And it was a product of a more hopeful time when people did think that we were moving towards an era where globalization would bind the world together. And on the basis of our economic links, we could build a political superstructure and a set of laws which would bind us together. And that is a, a vision which was absolutely embraced, I think, more than anywhere else in Europe, which is the, the big um, theme of this year's conference. And when we talk about the pressure on Europe, um, it's as much a pressure on that ideal of what how the world would work as it is on any individual countries uh, or political systems, which, which we're seeing at the moment. What I um, came to realize as uh, the troops uh, left from Afghanistan was that people might be seeing the end of the forever war, but they certainly weren't going to enter a period of forever peace. In fact, quite the opposite. And I think to understand how geopolitics is changing, um, it, it seems strange to, to do this as, as tanks have, have uh, 
have gone into uh, into Ukraine. But I, I think even in in Ukraine, in this conflict uh, which, which Russia has has launched on Ukraine, what you're seeing is lots of other aspects which um, belie the, the sort of conventional feel of, of what's happening at the moment. In some ways, the, the attack on, on, uh, on Ukraine feels a bit like what happened in, in Prague in 1968 or Hungary in 1956, but actually it's a very different kind of war that is being launched. And I think to understand some of the different dimensions of that war, and in fact of all wars, what we need to do is, is not focus so much on, on Afghanistan and on these sort of classic um, fighting wars, but to look at some of the other events which have taken place over the last year. So I just want to look back at the last couple of years at some of the big stories that have taken place, which I think tell us a lot about how geopolitics will be in the future. So the obvious place to start after what we've been living through is with COVID. One would have thought that uh, a, uh, an Ill, uh, a, a disease like COVID would bring the world together and bring out uh, our cooperative instincts. But in fact, what happened very quickly was we saw instead the emergence of vaccine, uh, of, sorry, of, of mass diplomacy and vaccine nationalism as countries hoarded and stockpiled their own medical supplies and their PPE, China in particular, and then used those supplies to, to either curry favour with, with friendly countries or to bully countries that were, were not uh, cooperating with them. It's another um, story of the last couple of years is the, the protest that took place um, after George Floyd was, was murdered, the Black Lives Matter movement. There was a, 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 an incredible surge of, uh, of support for the protesters around the world. There's a particularly powerful set of, of tweets that came out of African countries often calling on for violence on, on the so-called fascist police. And this felt like a geopolitical awakening. It was only afterwards that people realised that the troll factories that were putting out some of these uh, messages um, in places like Ghana um, and Nigeria were in fact being funded and uh, had been set up by uh, Russian secret services. Um, Huawei um, is a, another uh, interesting story of recent years, the world's uh, most successful handset manufacturer. It worked for a very long time with, with Google the most uh, that had created the most successful platform. But we saw uh, what happened when um, they tried to build the, the 5G infrastructure in lots of different countries and the Trump administration put Huawei on a, on, on a banned entities list. Um, and uh, in many ways, that sort of conflict over, over this, which stopped Google and Huawei working together more closely and, and started a cycle of escalation where um, various uh, Chinese companies were put on American entities lists and China uh, created its own entities lists and, and targeted American technologies, showed how um, in the future we're seeing a balkanization, not just of our, of our technology markets, but in fact, even of the idea of knowledge as uh, universities uh, have, have stopped working together in the way they were before and, and researchers have been expelled from different places. This is a picture of um, the supermarket shelves in Britain in December 2020, not very much to, to be uh, bought. Um, the reason, the proximate reason for this was that the French government had decided to uh, stop ferries from uh, taking goods over to the UK, ostensibly because of fears of contagion from COVID. But many people in the British government in Downing Street thought this had more to do with the Brexit endgame and the negotiations for a, for a future uh, trade deal between the two countries, and that the French government was trying to put uh, Britain under, under pressure to, to, to stop them going forward. This is a picture of uh, the Straits of Hormuz, where the Iranian Navy um, uh, around the same time as the, the supermarket story there was taking um, um, ships hostage, um, partly to, to push back on the crippling sanctions which have been imposed on them uh, by the West. Um, that's, a, I think, a South Korean um, uh, ship that they, um, that, 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 that they took hostage. Um, and uh, this is a picture of the Turkish-Greek border um, it could also have been a picture of, 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 uh, of the uh, Belarusian uh, Polish border, um, 
These are Syrian refugees uh, who are looking for a better life. Uh, the Turkish president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, had opened the border and encouraged them to go through the border um, in search of, 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 of this better life. But um, people um, who had studied the situation and his behavior seriously realized that maybe it wasn't a humanitarian mission that was motivating him, but rather an idea of turning uh, migrants into weapons in order to extract uh, political uh, compromises from, from Europeans who were scared that they would come across the borders. And um, it's a picture of the the Amazon uh, in, uh, in, in, in Brazil, um, climate change um, uh, is ma in many ways the, the greatest symbol of the fact that we all live in one world. After all, what is more connected than the air we breathe and the, the atmosphere that, that we share. Um, but even uh, climate change, something which you would have thought would get us all focused on our common survival, has often um, been treated as a, as a geopolitical chess game. And uh, Brazilian President Bolsonaro tried to extract uh, you know, billions of, of, of dollars from the rest of the world in order to, to slow down the destruction of the Amazon rainforest, something which he had accelerated as a result of, of, of his policies. So what do, um, what do all of these different forces, which seem uh, very kind of disparate, Chinese bullying, um, American uh, regulation, Russian trolling, Brazilian blackmail, French uh, trade policy, Iranian piracy, all have in common. Um, what they have in common, though, they happen in, in different parts of the world, is the fact that they're all symbols of this new type of political violence, which I described at the beginning, which is the idea of, of taking the ties that bind us together and turning them into instruments of political power um, and even uh, into uh, weapons. Um, I argue that um, in the world that we're uh, living in, geopolitics has become like a, a loveless marriage where uh, we can't get divorced. And just as in uh, a marriage, um, it's the things which brought us together in the good times um, that are being used to, to hurt one another in the bad times. And in a marriage, it's who gets the holiday home, who gets to keep the, the pet uh, dog or cat, and above all, who gets custody of the, the kids. These are the ways that um, the couple will, will try and inflict harm on one another. But in geopolitics, it's all of the different forces that were meant to be binding us together and, and, and creating um, one world. Um, and uh, the images which I showed earlier are some of the, the, the different features of that. I call this um, the age of unpeace because on the surface, it looks like we are living in a, a golden era of peace. I come from a family whose history has been totally shaped by uh, geopolitical conflict over, over the years. My mother's family, uh, German Jews. My mother was born in hiding during the, the Second World War. Many of her relatives were exterminated in, in, in the camps. Um, my father's earliest memories were of being evacuated as an eight-year-old um, during the Second World War. He was British. Um, he uh, grew up with tales of the Great War because his, his father enlisted to fight in, in 1918, a few days after the, the war started. Um, and my life um, has uh, not been shaped by uh, those sorts of sacrifices and those sorts of geopolitical ructions which uh, had turned the European continent into a graveyard in earlier centuries. Um, in fact, if we look at the world over the last uh, couple of decades, what we find is that on average, um, you know, well under 100,000 people are being uh, are dying in armed conflicts every year, many less people than are committing suicide. So many people have therefore argued that we live uh, in a golden age of peace. But I um, 
that came to to realize through my work that actually underneath the surface of um of uh this age of peace um is a huge amount of violence and and suffering which is affecting not just tens of thousands of people like conventional wars but in fact um you know hundreds of millions or if not uh, even billions uh, of people and what has been happening under the cover of um uh, uh, of, of peace because we haven't uh, been in a situation where we see wars that happen like they used to happen between um, two states. We, they start with a declaration of war. They're fought by soldiers with with uniforms on them, and they end with a with a with a peace treaty. It is in fact uh, a different kind of of, of geopolitics, where um, people are using all of these different points of of, of contact with one another, um, and um, uh, to uh, seek power and glory uh, to get their countries ahead and to to, to put other countries uh, down, and um, we have struggled to to recognise it, to to define it. But the the price that has been paid is is, is very um, uh, uh, large, and I'll go through some of the the different um, uh, battlegrounds over which it's fought. Um, uh, which will show how how serious um, uh, this is becoming. Um, And I think it's also very important that just because there aren't body bags coming back in the traditional way and we don't have military uh, cemeteries, that we face up to the fact that this is happening. And in the cyber world, they have been struggling with this uh, question of of how to define um, uh, the the conflict which has been going on through uh, a technology which was meant to bring the world together and create a global village. And they they resurrected this old-fashioned Anglo-Saxon word, which I think is rather beautiful, the idea of unpeace, which signifies that what is happening isn't sort of conventional war, but it's definitely not peace. And I think that um, what started with cyber has moved to trade, to the internet, to migration, to uh, our information, to international law, to all sorts of different areas. And the only way of understanding where we're at the moment is to think of it as the age of of unpeace. Um, As I said earlier, um, the battlefields of this age of unpeace are all the things that that were meant to bring us together. In my book, I argue that um, what we have discovered is that connectivity, which was uh, has done so much to to create uh, a more prosperous and sophisticated world, and has done so much to improve our, our civilization. At the same time, has both given people a motive to 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 fight each other and to conflict with one another, a series of opportunities to do it, and a whole new arsenal of weapons. The motive, I think, comes from the way that connectivity and the bringing of people together has led our societies increasingly to to become polarized into uh, different tribes that don't uh, relate to one another, that live in different different filter bubbles and even have a different sense of reality. Um, Those um, tribes increasingly feel uh, a lot of grievance and envy because uh, one of the features of the internet is it's changed our spheres of comparison. When I was a child, we tended to compare ourselves to our our neighbors, maybe to our parents or our grandparents. But the the nature of the internet is that everyone in the world can compare themselves to the most privileged people anywhere else. And in fact, sometimes to fictional ideas of their lives and their own reality can only fall short in those circumstances. So there is this sort of floating epidemic of envy, which is uh, which is creating a lot of grievances. And that then relates to 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 sort of politics and, and uh, where people feel that this connected world is out of control. And the, the idea of taking back control has become the leitmotif of politics in many different places. And it means, means that people are sort of pushing back um, and seeking um, uh, to, to 
undermine uh, interdependence and internationalism, as we saw with Brexit in the UK and, and Donald Trump in the in the US. There is this new appetite. So that's the sort of motive which connectivity gives to, for conflict. The opportunities come from the fact that we have these unprecedented links with each other. During the Cold War, there was almost no contact between the free world and the Soviet Union. But now um, we're bound together so closely that there are lots of different ways of, of hurting one another. And, and that's uh, what what um, these, these new battlefields, the new weapons um, uh, show us. And if you look even at the, the sort of conflict which we're seeing between Russia and the West at the moment, you, even though there are tanks going into Ukraine, a lot of the discussion is about these different battlefields being used in, in different ways. And I'm just going to run through them briefly and then talk a bit about the, the great powers of, of connectivity and end with a few words on what we can do to stop um, this world getting completely out of control. So um, this is the sort of traditional way that we've thought about, about power being exercised um, through overseas bases and, and, and military tools. And um, it's still um, very relevant. But what is interesting is that the use of military is overlaid with all of these other tools of power, which are often, um, in fact, um, uh, you know, even more, well, they're both easier to use, but sometimes uh, even, even more powerful. Um, so the, the, the most obvious terrain, which was the one which was meant to bring the world together and, and genuinely create a kind of economic base, which would uh, bind the whole world together and make war so costly that we couldn't contemplate it, is, is about trade and financial integration. And um, Nowadays, uh, if you look at all the coverage of of, uh, of the war in Ukraine, the big story today is about whether Russia is going to be kicked out of uh, out of SWIFT, which is the financial exchange program which allows its banks to be part of the global economy. But economic coercion is is something which uh, lots of, of of different countries have used over the years. This is a map which just shows a few examples of people using economic coercion against Europeans, whether it's the Chinese. Um, uh, threatening car tariffs to pressure Germany to accept Huawei's uh, infrastructure or Turkey boycotting French label products when it was upset with Emmanuel Macron's um, announcement of policies to combat extremism or, uh, or Russia banning uh, Czech uh, beer imports after the Czech government declared uh, that um, uh, some of the um, uh, it's uh, well blamed uh, Russian intelligence services for for an act of terror in their country. Anyway, that's become uh, the sanctions have become the the tool of first resort when people are, are trying to to, uh, to 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 respond geopolitically, as we're seeing with the Western response to Ukraine. Health, we talked about um, earlier. It's maybe the, the most unlikely uh, battlefield for influence in the world. But this map shows the number of countries that decided to uh, introduce temporary export measures on medical products when the pandemic started. So rather than working out how to cooperate and save our common humanity, uh, 97 countries um, immediately introduced export bans and restrictions to stop other countries um, uh, getting access to their products. And much of the discourse around uh, COVID has been about um, vaccine nationalism and, um, and mass diplomacy and other ways of, of using um, uh, the scarceness of resources to, to, for, for political uh, 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 goals. This um, is the sort of third battlefield, um, which is uh, increasingly important, which is the idea of, of, of linking the world up so that countries become dependent on you and then using that dependence to, to create spheres of influence around yourself. So the map of the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, uh, a massive set of infrastructure projects worth several times the, the, the price of the Marshall Plan, uh, building uh, roads and railways and pipelines, but above all, a digital infrastructure to connect the whole of the world to, to, to China and put them in a position where China um, is able uh, to, to leverage uh, those connections in order to not just uh, benefit economically, but politically as well. 
The technological and information space is enormously important. We talked a bit about 5G and Huawei uh, beforehand, cyber attacks, um, uh, the battle to to set standards for for the future in AI and other areas. But also um, uh, because we now have connected information spaces, uh, increasingly people are trying to, to interfere in our debates and in our elections. This map shows that Um, There were attempts uh, between 2011 and 2020 to uh, interfere in in dozens of different elections with almost uh, 2 billion people um, uh, voting in in these referendums and and, and elections. Um, Even climate, um, as I said earlier, has has emerged as a a battleground. The European Union is talking about introducing uh, carbon pricing. Um, and a carbon border adjustment mechanism in order to to stop uh, exports, uh, to stop uh, carbon um, emissions being exported to other parts of the world or carbon leakage, as as, as they call it. But um, um, other people see this as as protectionist um, and uh, shows that that even climate is is becoming more of a zero sum rather than the sort of positive sum space where we thought that that we would gradually see a move from nationalism to to common uh, international solutions, from power to to law, from uh, politics to science. In fact, things have been going very much in the opposite direction over the last few years. And we talked about migration and the way that Erdogan and and Lukashenko have used migrants as as, as tools. Um, It turns out it wasn't such an original thing to do. Seven over 75, it's happened over 75 times over the last few years. um, And is in fact a much more successful way of getting your political objectives than, than using sanctions or military power. And it's something which allows weaker countries like Belarus or Morocco, or Turkey, or Cuba to, to lord it over superpowers, countries that they could never take on with, with bombs. Um, different techniques are being used uh, in this networked world. And what is interesting is that using uh, sanctions or other types of coercion isn't new. But what is new is the hyper-connected nature of our, of our universe. And um, networks... Uh, You know, we were told by Tom Friedman that the network world, the world of globalization would be flat. In fact, it's very mountainous. Some people are much more connected than others. And it's the asymmetries in the system which allow people to to um, to to exercise power. And here on this map, I talk about seven different ways that people uh, and countries have been using power, ranging from trying to make themselves central, making rules, data mining, seeking independence, gatekeeping, infiltration. We can talk about these things later on because I'm uh, rather over time. So I'm going to um, uh, um, end by by, uh, talking about the kind of different superpowers um, in this world. There are lots of different countries that are using connectivity conflicts as a way of of exercising power. I mentioned some of them earlier. Russia, in, in many ways, is the sort of archetype that's used everything from energy cutoffs to cyber attacks to election interference. Um, and um, in the Ukraine uh, situation, which I'm sure we're going to talk about a lot in the discussion, you can see a lot of these things on display. But there are only three great powers which can actually change the whole way that our global networks work. And they have quite different ways of looking at the world. Washington is the most powerful and the most connected country in the world. I call it the gatekeeper power. And it has two kind of central strategies. One is deciding who's in and who's out of the system. And the other is using these great networks, whether it's the control of the dollar and the global financial system or the internet, to to keep an eye on what other people are doing and to, 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 to influence their behavior as a result of that. The second um, connectivity empire is Beijing, which uh, has got a very different philosophy. They call uh, it a relational way of thinking about things. They don't look at the hubs in the system like the US does, but rather at how many links different countries have between one another and how central they are to the system. Going back to sort of um, Confucian times, they've had particular focus on on the nature of connectivity and the hierarchical relationships um, uh, which uh, are contained within it. China's always wanted to be the middle kingdom and this belt and road 
initiative is a new way of turning itself into a middle kingdom which can have relationships of dependence with other parts of the world. And Brussels, Europe, our theme for this conference, has got a very different way of thinking about the networks. It's less focused on the individual, on the, on the ties and on the relationships and more focused on the rules and the operating system which governs the systems. To join the European Union, you have to implement 80,000 pages of laws, which is the rule book for, for the European system. And that is used to, to, to govern how countries are, operate. Um, and what the European Union has done is tried to turn all of its trade and other relationships into a way to get other countries to follow its, its rule book. Increasingly, geopolitics is going to be a battle between these different ways of thinking about connectivity, um, looking at both how smaller and, and, and medium-sized countries can, can uh, take advantage of openings in the age of unpeace, but also these three superpowers are increasingly going to try and bind other countries into their way of doing things. Um, most countries are not uh, based in, 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 in Europe or in, most people don't live in Europe, America or China, they live in the rest of the world. And um, they are, their fear that they're gonna have to choose between these three big empires of, of, of connectivity, but they also have uh, ways of taking advantage of this. What I fear is going to happen as this world um, uh, dynamic takes off and unpeace um, carries on defining so much of, uh, of, our, of our lives where um, all of the things which we had great hope would make the world into a kind of safer and more united place, in fact, become instrumentalized and weaponized by different players, is that um, things could, could, uh, could get out of control and you could see um, all sorts of uh, new conflicts emerging, whether it's massive cyber attacks, um, whether it's the weaponization of, uh, of migration, um, or our failure to tackle the, the big threats to humanity, such as future pandemics and climate change. Um, if these things become overlaid, we could end up in a, in a really uh, dangerous place. And I kind of argue in the book that rather than having a sort of architecture for a new open world, which is what I thought I was going to be calling for when I embarked on this uh, exercise, instead what we need is to accept that connectivity is a double-edged sword. It both gives us extraordinary advances in our civilization, but it can also uh, create an enormous amount of violence and danger. And what we need to do is to understand that better and learn to, to live with it. And in uh, my travels around the world, I found myself reading a book called Facing Codependence in a book in my favorite bookshop in Beijing, the, the Bookworm, which described the sort of psychological roots of, of the world we're in, where relationships between uh, players uh, become inescapable, but also toxic. And that gave us, a, it showed a sort of five-step plan for trying to, to make that those relationships uh, livable with before they, they created uh, total um, uh, uh, chaos in, in people's lives. But the only surprise I had was that this was in the self-help section rather than in the international politics section. But in my book, I, I set out a five-step a therapy program for the age of unpeace, uh, which looks at how we can work to bet, uh, together as a as a world and um, and avoid um, the age of unpeace becoming something which could be even more dangerous and and cataclysmic than um, the uh, dangers that we lived with during the Cold War. And maybe um, uh, I should save some of those therapeutic lessons for, for the discussion afterwards as I've come to the end of my 30 minutes. Mr. Leiter, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And uh, um, everyone participating, start getting your questions in. Some have come in and we'll incorporate them into the discussion, but uh, I'm sure you have <clears throat> some queries and now is the time uh, so that I can pose them in front of everybody. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, your argument is about these interrelationships being weaponized. It's about the fact that we don't play nice with these tools. So in an overarching way, how do we, um, how do we come up with systems? I mean, you have your five point self-help system. Maybe that'll help us understand this. How do we come up with global systems that will encourage 
countries to not weaponize, to play nicer with these tools? I mean, the UN tried in an earlier era, really. So I think part of what I've learned over the last few years is that we have to accept that you know, there is a degree of competition which is baked into human nature and into the international system, and that um, it's very difficult to eliminate it. So what you need to do is to try and challenge it, and you also need to, to try and arrange your relationships in a way that they are less painful and, and, and less uh, risky. And I think that's um, part of the... The big lesson of the last few years, you know, in the early years after the end of the Cold War, people were unbelievably optimistic about what globalization would bring us. And, and um, you had these books like Tom Friedman's book, The World is Flat, which seemed to argue that we would have a, you know, a period of, of, uh, of perpetual peace ahead of us and that people would uh find it impossible to go to war with one another if they had mcdonald's um in their countries um the war between um russia it, sorry is this still working or it's something hit a time limit on the powerpoint so you okay. stop sharing your screen sorry it's interrupting your flow I'm sorry. Anyway, we're just seeing in in uh, the war in Ukraine uh, between Ukraine and Russia, two countries with McDonald's um, conflicting with each other. Something which we were told would be um, would be um, uh, politically um, uh, impossible uh, because of um, because of uh, um, um, uh, the, the kind of power of globalization to to bring people together, and so I, my kind of feeling is that rather than um, assuming that um, uh, we can, you know, el completely eliminate that competition, what we need to do is to to think a bit more about how you arrange the the relationships so that they are uh, safer. And I think the big uh, danger with with connectivity is when you get unbalanced relationships where one side needs the other side much more and is therefore open to be blackmailed and bullied. Um, so a very good example of that is the, the energy relationship which Europeans have with Russia. 15 years ago, Russia literally turned the lights out in Ukraine and in a number of European countries because they were completely dependent on Russian gas for all of their energy supplies. And this was a, a sort of big shock. And the threat of, of turning the lights off was something which gave Russia a lot of power over its neighbors. Um, as a result, um, Europeans actually discovered that there were about 14 different countries in, in, the, in the European Union that were energy islands. They literally didn't have any other way of getting energy other than Russia. And they started to use a series of different mechanisms, whether it was building uh, grids which connected different countries together, putting reverse flow into the pipeline so that um, energy could flow both ways, um, using regulatory tools to 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 change um, the, the 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 way that companies worked. They basically um, have completely transformed the energy market so that nobody can be cut off anymore. Um, if the Russians decided to, to stop giving us gas, it would create problems and could create a massive spike in our prices. But they don't have the same ability to bully us as that they had 15 years ago. Um, and I think that's that's one kind of interesting uh, example of, of something which we're seeing in lots of other realms as well. For example, on trade, um, you know, before people were very very focused on uh, on driving prices down as as much as possible and finding ways of um uh of of getting um as many trade deals as as, as possible um without thinking about what the impact was on 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 particular sectors of their economy different parts of their country and you found uh, you know part of the backlash against globalization has come from the fact that that certain parts of the country in the US or in the UK, for example, were very, very badly affected by trade with China. And now we're having a very different um, debate about trade where people are trying to get the benefits of free trade, but to think a bit more about what the, imp what the implications are for our own um, uh, economic systems and how you prepare people for that, how you make it safer. We're having a different debate about immigration as well. It's not just about having 
um, totally open borders, but people are thinking about about um, the impact of immigration um, on our social services, on our uh, and even on our kind of culture and languages, and the whole idea of integration. Countries like the US have obviously been thinking about that forever because you're countries of immigration. But it's interesting how many European countries um, that. Uh, had no real history of, of of immigration, have had to to come to terms with some of those lessons. How do you integrate large numbers of people? How do you make them feel a sense of attachment and citizenship to the country? And they're moving from an idea that citizenship was something which was a, a you know a gift through blood towards something which was more to do with the values and uh, of, um, and the the things which one holds dear in that society. And then finding ways of writing these things down and passing them on to to, to other people. And I think these are all ways of actually introducing a bit more friction. And if you look at the world at the moment, you have a big debate in, in the US about, um, uh, you know, about decoupling from, from China selectively in, in some areas, not letting Chinese companies get access to the most sensitive bits of your, of your technology and of your, of your economy. Um, in Europe, there's a debate about uh, about European sovereignty and strategic autonomy, and people are very worried about about the energy relationship with Russia, about letting China have access to our 5G infrastructure. And in China itself, there, there's a big debate about the future of globalization. They're talking about dual circulation. So instead of thinking about a, a single economy in China, they think about internal circulation, which is about um, China's uh, internal economy and they want to grow that so that it relies less on on exports and more on um, domestic consumption um, and less on imported technology from elsewhere because they're worried that they could get bullied by other countries um, uh, so they want to have more indigenous innovation and they're sort of looking at how to replace foreign technologies with things which well they some of the sanctions that uh, are being uh, applied to russia in reaction to the situation in ukraine have been, for instance, to cut off the flows of tech to Russia. So you can imagine Russia, there will be a reaction to that over years, trying to become more independent in the way that you're describing China has tried to do. Absolutely. That, you know, they, I remember back in 2014 going to Russia just after they'd annexed Crimea, and a lot of Russians were terrified then that, that Russian banks were going to be thrown out of SWIFT. So a lot of Chinese people started getting credit cards um, with union pay systems instead of ones with MasterCard or Visa or, or Western um, companies, because they thought they'd be able to carry on um, operating even if the West threw them out of the system. Now, I, that's not the world I want to live in, one where you go back to autarky. But I think the, 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 the uh, lesson in all this is that I think people are thinking in more subtle ways um, about how to have... Uh, connections with one another, but to organize them in a way that don't open them up to, to being transformed and blackmailed and hurt by, by other players. And that that is a, is a, is a good instinct. I mean, it, my feeling is that the big split in the 21st century is not going to be between open and closed societies, but it's more between managed and unmanaged globalization. If you give people a sense that we have, have got some control over what happens and that things aren't totally out of control, then they're more likely to, to embrace it. Um, if they think things are totally out of control, that's when they, they want to build walls. And I think that's the, the big threat of, of, uh, of where we are at at the moment. There's so many people attempted by building walls and that would be terrible for the world. Let me try one of the questions, another one of the questions on you from the participants in the panel here. Um, it's about, is the contrary to what you're talking about true. Um, uh, Samantha Goodwin of Piscataquis Community Secondary School puts it this way. Uh, philosopher Slavoj Zizek, weirdly I've watched a film with him in it, so I actually sort of weirdly get the reference. I'm probably mispronouncing his name, but he's in favor, she says, of alienation from the neighbor to achieve <laughs> peace you are inclined to agree. Are you inclined to agree with him, given that things that are meant to bind us together tear us apart? Maybe we should retreat uh, a bit. I know my parents thrived when they got away from the oppressive bonds of the the families that they grew up with, and thrived because they were they didn't have to listen to anybody anymore. So, do good fences make good neighbors? Yeah. <laughs> um, 
I, I mean, I think that selectively uh, decoupling in some areas where there's a lot of tension can be a, a kind of a healthy thing. I mean, my own, you know, where I started with at the very beginning of the talk is the fact that my life has, you know, been improved immeasurably by connectivity, by internationalism. And um, what I've been trying to understand is why a lot of the things that I find so attractive and that have made my life so much better, exactly the same forces have been seen by many other people as threatening them and as making them more vulnerable. And I've tried to understand that. And the Brexit campaign for me in the UK was a real wake up call in that regard, because um, almost all the things that I thought were wonderful about the, the European experience of the last few decades had been experienced by large numbers of people, 52% of people in the UK, in exactly the opposite way from how I'd seen them. And I was trying to understand how that could happen. And my feeling is that um, it's because we focused on the, the aggregate benefits, the fact that it made the whole country or the whole world richer and safer and better. And we didn't think about what the lived experiences of different people were who felt um, some of the other forces that that, that I was talking about, that, that um, things became a bit out of control, that they, they felt they were becoming strangers in their own countries, that there are losers as well as winners. And I think once you become more aware of the different ways that people experience connectivity, you can see who the losers are and you can try and mitigate their their losses and and help them out. And, you know, I think, for example, um, uh, the Brexit um, uh, debate in the UK, one of the most uh, powerful debates was about immigration, which was obviously very good for the country as a whole. It created a lot of uh, wealth. It was absolutely central to the social infrastructure of the country. The National Health Service would have collapsed decades ago without the 30,000 doctors and nurses that came from other European countries to tend to people. There would be no hospitality industry, no food picked from the um, <laughs> from from the fields in the UK, were it not for immigration from other places. I mean, the, the country would literally have come to a, to a halt. But at the same time, so it was good. And the people who came were paying much more taxes than they were receiving in benefits. They were making a net contribution to the economy. At the same time, certain people um, in some parts of the country found that large numbers of people came into their communities and they didn't have any extra doctors or, or, or school places given to them because nobody knew that anyone was coming in or out of, of their communities. So more money wasn't given to the governments to pay for these things. So that created pressure on, on public services. And in some parts of the country, wages went down as well. If you're a construction worker in some parts of the country, wages went down quite a lot when large numbers of, of Polish uh, workers came in who were willing to do the job for, for less than the, the indigenous uh, British workers were beforehand. Um, at, but if we had tracked that um, and been aware that it might be an issue, then the government could have done things to stop that happening. But, at, you know, at the beginning of, of um, in 2004, when they opened the borders to people from Eastern Europe, they asked the government how many people they thought would come. And the Treasury said that 13,000 people would probably come to the UK. And it ended up being one and a half million people. So that's the sort of intelligence failure, which makes what happened on Iraq with WMD feel very trivial. Um, and by the way, for Americans watching, the data on the effect of immigration on wages here is in the US is much more complex. And there isn't a hard connection between lower wages in the US and immigration, um, uh, and it's an interesting literature on that, but I just wanted to point that out that Britain might have been in a slightly different case. We've got an interesting question here um, from Vincent Hahn, who brings us back to Ukraine and Russia, and you've talked about, um, about some of that conflict will play out in these more informal means. There could be cyber warfare, there'll be information warfare, there is already sanctions being lodged, uh, and so forth. But to what extent is what's happening now in with Russia and Ukraine not part of your paradigm? That it's in fact a throwback to something else where old school power is being thrown around at the at the you know at the muzzle of a gun. I mean, I think what we're seeing is a, a merging of 
uh, of different types of power. So my argument was not that military power would never be used. In fact, in the book, you know, one of the scenarios that that um, I, I look at, which I find quite plausible and absolutely terrifying, is a is a war over Taiwan. Um, but the way that these wars happen are quite different. So if you look at the the war between Russia and Ukraine at the moment, on the one hand, it looks eerily familiar. If you go back to the history books, it you sort of feel it should be in black and white with grainy kind of footage um, of you know people. Um, uh, as I said, you know, it does feel like 1956 or 1968 when kind of Russian tanks were going into different places. And um, and it, it's really depressing. It's the sort of thing that many uh, people had hoped would would never be seen in Europe again, that that was the big advance of the last um, few decades is that that we've managed to 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 make those sorts of things feel unthinkable in Europe. And the fact that they're back is, is a massive shock to, to the system. At the same time, I do think that um, the most powerful weapons being used um, at the moment are, are in fact these other tools. So the main Western response, you know, we are giving weapons to 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 the Ukrainians, where, you know, and the fact the German government today just decided to 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 uh, to do a U-turn and to allow um, um, anti-tank missiles and stingers and things like that to to be sent to to Ukraine, but the biggest contribution which we have is going to be uh, based on on sanctions and ways of trying to punish um, Putin um, for uh, his uh, breaches of international law in the economic realm. And a lot of the ways that he is uh, using to undermine Ukraine have also been these unconventional uh, techniques trying to destabilize the political system. And, and I think the ultimate end game, you know, it, th this is maybe not totally new because Clausewitz uh, said that the that war is, is politics through other means. But the other means of, of politics now are increasingly about manipulating interdependence, even when it comes to, to um, uh, actual physical kinetic wars where weapons are used. Um, those weapons are often just one tool out of uh, a whole uh arsenal of, of other weapons on the different battlegrounds that I'm talking about. And what we're seeing increasingly is sort of total uh, war or total unpeace um, being used in different ways. And, you know, whatever settlement we find to this conflict in Ukraine, I suspect is not going to be the end of the, the conflict. It will carry on um, through all of those different tools that, that, that we've been talking about um, even after um, uh, the, the kind of um, violent fighting phase uh, of this war is over. Yeah, actually, I appreciate you mentioning Clausewitz because we've started a drinking game on this uh, <laughs> conference that for every mention you get to have a sip. And in your time zone, it's perfectly acceptable to have a drink uh, at this point. Um, uh, interesting question from Maid Zaidan, who's uh, watching the conference in Philadelphia. Um, she's wondering about, um, do you think increased connectivity could play a role in empowering the Russian population to rethink the authoritarianism of Putin? And we know that Putin uses uh, electronic means and disinformation to polarize um, democracies. But what about the other way? Um, well, I think that, you know, there is a battle of narratives that's going on, not just in, um, you know, I mean, both in all of our own societies. You know, I think part of the point about conflict in the age of unpeace is that um, it's very much uh, about um, the resilience of our societies, the willingness for people to to put up with um, uh the, the the sort of sacrifices that you need to make and therefore you know the you know both on our side the russians are going to to try um to make uh our citizens feel that the the, the higher gas prices and energy prices they're paying are um uh, are uh, uh, sort of painful in order to break the kind of will of Westerners to put up with them for, for a long period of time. But also, I suspect that um, 
there will be attempts being made. And, and Vladimir, Vladimir Zelensky um, has, has been trying to communicate directly with the Russian people as well. Um, and, uh, you know, he gave this very moving um, speech um, a, a couple of uh, nights ago in, with a large passage in Russian where he was actually trying to communicate directly to the Russian people. They've set up a helpline um, for Russian citizens who want to find out if their relatives have been killed in the war in Ukraine, partly to, to drive home the fact that the people are dying pointlessly um, in this conflict between uh, con people. So I think information warfare is going to be uh, very important. And I suspect we will see, uh, as well as the sort of sanctions and what's being used with, you know, you, you mentioned the technological um, uh, warfare that's going to um, uh, take place where people are going to try and stop Russia getting access to sensitive technologies which it needs for its economy. I mean, you're going to see a lot of these different tools being used by the West as well as by the Russians. So when I send, uh, with my vote, a politician to Washington, I want her to represent my interests, the interests of my state, for instance. And I guess we should be forgiven if we expect our national governments to represent our interests. And so uh, Michael Levy uh, has a question here. In simpler times, nations were opportunistic in order to advance or protect themselves. To what extent is your thesis, uh, Mark, that the same thing is happening in these more connected times, that we're not advancing a grander global, uh, let's help everyone cause, but a more let's advance our people's cause. Well, I still hope that we can get people uh, to have a bigger idea of who our people are and to kind of think about the, the common uh, interests that we have as human beings and to see that, in fact, you know, what's good for, uh, for our people is often good for other people as well. Like with getting the COVID vaccines to all parts of the world. That would be a great example of that. Exactly. I mean, it's kind of crazy, the idea that to think that you can have um, good health in one country. I mean, what you risk creating is a massive laboratory where new variants of COVID are being spread amongst the unvaccinated, which will then very quickly come back to us. I mean, the the whole uh, fact that our world was shut down because of a virus that started somewhere in in China in a place which most people have never even heard of you know shows how difficult it is to to shut ourselves off from what's going on in other places so i i, I do hope that um that we can expand people's idea of what their self interest is and also try and find ways of uh of getting countries to work together getting people to work together i think that the internet has shown extraordinary um, uh, capacity to create empathy with what's going on. If you look at the war in Ukraine, I think the plight of Ukrainians has touched people all over the world in different ways and brings out extraordinary signs of common humanity, which would have been unthinkable in in, in previous centuries, where you, you know you, there's no way that you'd have known as much about um, what was going on in the lives of people on the other side of the world. At the same time, those same forces can also divide us and create resentment. And, you know, I think we just have to be aware of that. But I, I, I don't think that, I mean, I, you know, I think that um, uh, it's possible to, to get people uh, to, to think a bit bigger, to understand, even from a kind of self-interested perspective, that their interests are not unrelated to the interests of other people and to, to, um, uh, to play on that innate capacity that people have for love and for empathy with, with people um, uh, who are different from, from, from one another. Um, but politics is often about reconciling these two things, our kind of selfishness and our desire for advancement with our altruistic uh, elements. And if you pretend that one uh, doesn't exist, then you often end up, you know, not doing very well. You know, the, the trick I think is to recognize our capacity for for good and evil, for self for selfishness and altruism, and to try and find ways of channeling both of these for uh, for the benefit of our own societies, but also of the world. We had an interesting question here from Nora about globalization. You know, if maybe we if further globalization would cause further conflict under the way that you see things. 
I mean, globalization is so complicated. First of all, it wasn't, uh, as you totally pointed out, uh, was not brought to us on a, f on a fair basis. For instance, a lot of people complain that uh, uh, China was allowed into the World Trade Organization without making you know, certain structural changes um, that would have uh, increased the fairness of its new participation. But um, the other big problem with globalization is that the disruption caused is felt by identifiable people who might lose their jobs. But the benefits are distributed in subtle ways, often to people who didn't know that globalization was benefiting them. It might be the next generation getting opportunity they wouldn't have before. And so these big processes, while in the aggregate, might be benefiting a society, still cause real disruption that become that have political consequences. I think that's absolutely right. And that's sort of what I was getting at when I spoke at, at great length earlier about migration in the UK. Right. The aggregate situation for the UK for wages as well was a good one. It made people richer, but there were people who were losers. And I think if you're aware of that, then you can try and redistribute some of the benefits. The difficulty is that a small number of people captured a lot of the benefits, and then another small number of people ended up um, cap, you know, suffering a lot of the, the losses. And most people might not have noticed it that much, even though they were, on average, better off. It wasn't so great that it was a game changer in their lives. And ideally, what you would do is try and find ways of of redistributing the, the the benefits to the people who are losing out so that you can make their lives a bit better off. And if you have massive benefits, which we do get from globalization and from connectivity, then um, you should be able to, to do things to, to, to help the people who um, are losing out. That's the role of politics. And I think by and large, Europeans have done better at that than, than America has or other parts of the world, because um, you know, the, the most successful European uh, states, particularly in Scandinavia and other places, are both very, very connected to the world, very globalized. They benefit a huge amount from those sorts of connections. But at the same time, they have less inequality and they have uh, generally happier uh, populations who believe more in in fairness and in politics because um, the state does a great job of, of trying to capture these benefits and then to spread them and to prepare people so that they can be more resilient for the shocks which uh, which globalization can bring into their lives. That's another really profound thought that you're that you're sharing. I mean, you've uh, in a long stretch of profound thoughts, <laughs> which is. Underlying inequality makes populations vulnerable to manipulations by these connections. And so you're like, well, well, how do we approach this? Well, maybe it's addressing inequality. I think that's absolutely right. You know, I think that, that um, uh, countries which are very unequal tend to be much more vulnerable to all sorts of things. Um, you know, they, they are more vulnerable to to political instability, they're more likely to go to war, they're more likely to have negative health conditions. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, you know, that some of the most successful countries in the world are, are, are not those that cut themselves off from the rest of the world and, and refuse to have anything to do with globalization, but they're ones that uh, go into globalization with open eyes and then try and, and um, make sure that they can be connected, but still, uh, as equal as possible and they stop people from literally being left behind and if you look at denmark at, at sweden at norway at finland um it, it's quite a, a, an impressive uh, setup where you have incredibly connected societies but um but they're countries that tend to outperform most of the rest of the world on lots of different dimensions they're rich that people citizens report that they're happier they have very good health levels. Their education systems are, 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 are very good. Um, and um, uh, one of the reasons for that, I think, is that they are uh, more equal than many other places. Well, we have quite a winter reading list now. We need Dr. Blythe's book, Angrynomics, from this morning. We need Sergei uh, Medvedev's book, uh, 
about the Russian Leviathan, and we now need Mark Leonard's book about the age of unpeace on our nightstands to get us through to the warmer weather that promises <laughs> to come. Mark, thank you for this very provocative discussion. It's been so interesting, and I appreciate it. Thank you. It's been absolutely wonderful talking to you.